takes me great pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker today, Mr. Shivrama Krishnan. Mr. Shivrama Krishnan joined the IAS in 1958 and has held a variety of positions in a long and distinguished career. In 1985, he joined the first project as the director of the Central Ganga Authority, which pioneered a program to combat pollution in the Ganga River. In 1988, he became the secretary Ministry of Urban Development and was personally involved in the legislation to amend the constitution to provide a framework for decentralization and empowerment of rural and urban authorities, leading to the 73rd and 74th amendment, becoming a part uh, of the constitution. After retiring from the IAS in 1992, he joined the World Bank as senior advisor for urban management. Since his return in 1996, he has been associated with the Center for Policy Research and the Institute of Social Sciences and is also the member of the National Technical Advisory Group for the JNNURM. Mr. Siv Ramakrishnan has authored several books and papers on urban management, decentralization, electoral reforms and the environment. His latest book, Revisioning India, Indian Cities, The Urban Rural Mission, was released in August 2011. Today, Mr. Shiv Ramakrishnan will be talking to us about India's megacities in the context of the findings of the 2011 census and the expected transition towards large urban agglomerations or megacities. He will be taking us through the various implications of this demographic change, including migration, electoral geography, the economy, and issues of governance. Our conversation today, conversationist today, is ORF's own Aaron Baskar. Baskar is an advisor to the ORF. His areas of interest include policy research, education, and journalism. I request uh, Baskar to give opening remarks, please. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for turning up here. Um, <clears throat> we invited Mr. Sivaramakrishnan for two reasons. One, there are very few speakers with the breadth of vision and the articulation as Mr. Sivaramakrishnan. You'll discover that for yourself in a little while. The second reason is we see urbanization and the formation of new cities as one of the most challenging developments before a country. With planned urbanization of about 300 million people over the next decade, the growth in the number of cities of over 1 million people in the last 10 years, they've gone up from 31 cities to over 53 cities. We think there'll be many, many more cities emerging. Some will be towns becoming cities, and some of them will be greenfield cities. But the most interesting aspect in the cities will be the 24 cities that are planned around the, along the DMIC, the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, because these cities, unlike any other city in India, will be built under a special provision of the constitution that gives them the status of industry cities like Jamshedpur is. Thus minimal, minimizing the possibility of political interference in these cities. Dholera is likely to be one of the first cities to be coming up. And these could be model cities which other cities may have to emulate if they do not want a migration of talent and business to the new cities. What the emergence of new cities will mean for India, I leave it to a speaker, Mr. Shiva Ramakrishnan, who has more knowledge and a tremendous vision in this area. Thank you very much. I present Mr. Shiva Ramakrishnan. One small thing. If you've got mobile phones, please keep them on the silent mode. Thank you. As a comment on this uh, DMIC corridor and the special provision, it's the speciality of lawyers, and particularly people who draft laws and constitutions, to provide an escape class. Before you are thought of the main law, you must think of the escape class. And so there is an escape class which is called Proviso to 243Q in the Constitution, the 74th Amendment. And that proviso says that while the whole country must have panchayats or municipalities, if there is 
an industrial township and the management undertakes to provide all the services. It may not be necessary for a municipality to be set up in that area. This is the proviso. And I have no hesitation in stating at the risk of putting my neck out that this has been a terrible, devious deception of the Constitution. And it was brought into existence by very devious circumstances because it was not there in the original draft and it was not there in the draft that was considered by the Joint Select Committee of the Parliament and it was introduced in the last minute as an amendment on the part of the government itself to facilitate this particular escape class. And so as a result, you have all these special economic zones and this so-called industrial townships and people find it tremendously convenient to apply this uh, proviso and it is not that only the familiar suspects you know are fond of this arrangement noida is one such various industrial townships in maharashtra in gujarat even my good old marxist friends of calcutta snatched two or three wards from an existing municipality and constituted it into an industrial township and gave it the highly romantic name of Nobo Diganto, which means new direction, new horizons. New horizons consist of Wipro, Infosys, and a huge battalion of the I think the border security force. <laughs> the super in, a senior IAS officer is the mayor of this industrial town of Nabodiganto. And he said, sir, I am the worshipful mayor, but you know there are no citizens and there is therefore nobody to worship me. <laughs> so I think this is the kind of game and uh, I was not aware of this proviso until much later because the act came into existence when, uh, you know, I had left the government. And subsequently, it required quite a bit of effort on my part, including an application under the RTI to find out how this proviso was introduced. That's another story, but uh, uh, I do feel, Mr. Bhaskar, that if you do believe for right or wrong reasons, we are all entitled to our private views, whether we subscribe to a democratic participatory system or not. If you do, this proviso does not sit with it. Because you are declaring suo moto that democracy and efficiency are contrary and therefore we do not want democracy, we want only efficiency. So long as you make this statement Consciously, it's okay, but don't make it casually. That is really, you know, my point, and uh, I think uh, it also so happens that in this particular case, which uh, Jamshedpur, you know, wants to have, because uh, Jamshedpur Tatas have been avoiding the setting up of a corporation for well over a hundred years, and uh, anyway, that is a different different story altogether. But I feel my, my starting point of all this is that whether we like it or not, we have a broad organizing democracy and participative structure of government is a broad organizing principle of our society. And to the best of my information, I don't think that that particular organizing principle has been annulled. And therefore, I am starting from that. Okay, are we on? Now you go ahead and start this. The only button I can press is the up or down button. <laughs> Don't ask me to do anything else. Okay, anything else is a challenge to my faculties. This one. Okay. All right. Okay, the next one I press this one. Excuse me, this one? Yes, sir. That's up the one? Down, that's all. Oh, very good. Okay. I got it. Okay, good. <laughs> so that's your 2001-2011 urban scene. The reds 
are the ones which are 35 percent or more urban and then you have the orange which is 30 to 35. I mean everybody knows we are becoming increasingly urban and uh, you know whatever is the upside or downside of that. This is therefore whether you like it or not, it's a demographic reality. This million plus cities, uh, we had until recently 35 of them, I've just given a partial list here and uh, until 2001 you had about uh, 108 million people, you know, living there and that was about 38 percent. And so to these 35 cities, 18 more cities have been added between 2001 and 2011 and good old Malappuram has had 896 percent growth in these past 10 years and that is confirmed by the census. Vasai Virar is 600, okay. So you have these 18 more cities and now these million cities, 53 million plus cities now account for 43 percent of our urban population. So it looks like that this concentrated urban settlements are again another demographic reality. We have these corridors and it looks like that these corridors are getting built. And therefore, these great transportation routes along which there are various settlements which are strung, this is also going to be an important aspect of India's urbanization. As you can very well see, I mean, from time immemorial, it is transport routes which have prompted this kind of urbanization. And you will also find that they are all taking place in these kind of clusters. And so, I think it's important for us to understand that in addition to urbanization being a demographic reality, it's also a spatial reality. Now, we're talking about this six, Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, Hyderabad, Chennai, Bangalore. I'm not going to talk much about Delhi. If absolutely necessary, you can deal with it during questions and answers because uh, to me, Fortunately, every country can afford only one capital and it is bad enough to have one and uh, it really baffles, uh, you know, any description of governance. Anyway, so we will talk about the other cities. Now, okay, this is something which many of you, you know, will have known before, how these metropolitan region. Now, this is the kind of a definition which some of us, you know, my colleagues and I in the, in the CPR have tried to work out. You have a municipal corporation and then you have your municipalities and other settlements. As you know, in Mumbai you have 13 of them plus numerous others. And if you take the metropolitan region as a whole, then those are the numbers that you are getting in. Now, of late, people have been saying <laughs> your core cities are not growing. Core cities are losing population and therefore you better watch out. Now, we have to rethink also what is core, what is periphery. We have to revisit some of this. So, even if in some cases the density in the core city may not be going up that much, the density in the rest of the metropolitan area is definitely going up. And therefore, it is not as if that the core is declining and the periphery is also declining. Both are growing. This is, this is the story of Bangalore. 8.4 million and now about 11 million people in the Bangalore corporation and you are talking, you know, about nearly uh, 8,000 square kilometers. <coughs> we have Chennai and uh, that is again you know, 8.4 million people as of now and a fairly large uh, metropolitan area. You have Hyderabad, 7 million, 7.7 .7 million now. And we have Kolkata. 
municipal corporation of kolkata has actually had a decline in total population the city but that is very small as compared to that the municipalities and other settlements in the kolkata metropolitan area has really been adding to its people and you know also the density has also been growing from 10000 to about 11400 the urban agglomeration as a whole is also growing incidentally our census does not recognize a mega city it only talks about an urban agglomeration and it does talk about million plus cities but it does not go beyond that one of the interesting things is that the census counts incidentally our census also makes a distinction between what is called a census town and what is called a statutory town now our census is one of the most enduring census operations in the world but the definitions go back 1960 a census town is one which has 5000 people 4000 people a density of 400 persons per square kilometer and gender advocates may kindly note a male working force of more than 75 percent in occupations other than agriculture census is not bothered about female working force those of you who are running out of gender issues to fight go ahead <laughs> there, there, there is one more battle waiting to be fought <laughs> so you have these census towns Statutory towns are those which any state government, for example, all these industrial townships and so on, they are statutory towns. Because they are called a town, the census has to include them. So actually between 2001 and 2011, the number of census towns have significantly increased. And this is pointed out by some people saying India's urbanization is spreading. It's no longer the big cities. But the point is that many of these census towns are taking place or they are coming as census towns, they are maturing as census towns within the metropolitan regions. As for example, in the case of Kolkata, out of 780 census towns, 443 are within the Kolkata metropolitan region. <coughs> Migration, a very important subject. All that I want to point out is that it is simply not true that people are knocking at the doors of the big city all the time in all the generations. It goes up and down. There is a temporal variation here. For some periods it's more, for some periods it's less. This is just to give you a feeling <coughs> that the migration figures follow a certain dynamic. Unfortunately, the migration figures are the last set of figures to be released by the census. This is almost in pursuant of an official policy that interstate migration figures may not be conducive to promoting feelings of national integration. And so the National Integration Council some years ago passed a resolution and they took a decision. Keep this data. The data that disturbs people, not facts. <clears throat> and so we will get the first set of 2011 migration figures sometime in 2015. 2014-15. That's the time. Until then the only figures we have is 2000 one figures and that also shows this variation but it's also important to understand where are these migrants coming from a sizable percentage come from within the state a fair percentage comes from outside the state <coughs> so there is always this question whose city in Delhi Everybody is a migrant. I mean, except those who are direct descendants of Sher Shah and Aurangzeb. <laughs> you know, every, everybody else is a migrant. Whereas, in, as far as the other cities are concerned, you know, 
from within the state, from other states. You know, the percentage does, does vary. So I think <clears throat> this is also something that is important to keep in mind. Okay, then of course, this is one of the subjects on which we know very, 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 very little. What is the shape and size of the urban economy in this country? What does it consist of? Where are the jobs? What are the kind of jobs? What are the shifts that are taking place? We know very little. <coughs> because the NSS data is on the basis of districts. The district boundaries do not coalesce with urban area boundaries or metropolitan boundaries. So it is a continuous game of adjusting, you know, the figures all the time. And we have this traditional kind of sectoral composition. And uh, for instance, you know, you can say financing, insurance, real estate and business services are clubbed together. Trade, hotels and restaurants, transport, storage and communication are clubbed together. So whether you are running, you know, a daba in the corner, or a tea stall around the corner, or whether you are running a shopping mall, it's all getting clubbed, you know, in that broad category. We do not know enough. We are ignorant, you know, about this, except for certain small portions, you know, of the city. And, of course, the per capita GDP, only 2,405 figures are available. Broadly speaking, it's a fairly high per capita GDP, per capita income. We have to understand that the slums in India are not a surrogate for urban poverty, certainly not in Mumbai. The slums are a manifestation of the lack of basic services. It's not a question of an absolute poverty. Under the Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission, one of the many reforms was that you must earmark X percentage of your municipal revenue for people below absolute poverty line. And the municipal commissioner very rightly pointed out, I don't have such people in Mumbai. <laughs> so the answer was, why don't you get So, you know, one more reform was signed in good faith. But I think it's important for us to remember that this is why, I mean, we have been discussing this for about 30 years, 40 years now. Okay, this is fairly important. Now, <clears throat> the electoral geography in these metropolitan areas, it seems to me, is a highly critical issue here. This is where we are facing a lot of problems. Now, if you take the Mumbai metropolitan region, metropolitan region, which means uh, Bombay, Navi Mumbai, Thane, Ulas Nagar, Bivandi, etc., etc., etc. You have 10 members of parliament and 60 MLAs. So out of 288 seats in the Maharashtra Assembly, 60 come from this region. And the corresponding figures are given in various other places. And if you also take the members of parliament, and then if you take all the elected councillors, 883 corporators in all these 13 municipalities and if you take all the other smaller municipalities that is 322. So in essence you have 1205 corporators, 10 MPs, 60 MLAs. Now they are all interested in the city. At least they regard the city as their common playground. They all play in that common turf. And one of our major problems is we do not have an intelligent way of guiding this particular game. Same thing is true, you know, with regard to the other cities. And another very, very important dimension, 23% of Maharashtra's electorate is in the Mumbai region. So it is in the case of Kolkata, 12, 18, 17% in the case. So, your metropolitan cities are a demographic reality, they are an economic reality, they are a spatial reality, they are a political reality. But these multiple realities do not necessarily converge. And that appears to be a very, very important, you know, organizational principle. 
And if you look at the electoral outcomes, we have been doing some comparative studies of different cities and different states and so on. Uh, you will find that, you know, in the case of Mumbai itself, you know, you have your Shiv Sena Mumbai, you have your Shiv Sena Thane, you have an NCP Navi Mumbai, you have a Kalyan Dombivili 29, <coughs> which is uh, uh, Shiv Sena, Ulas Nagar, and Bivandi Nizampur is supposed to be the stamp paper coalition. This is because those three parties there, they agreed that this is the way powers will be distributed and this will be the future vacancies. And all this was reduced in stamp paper agreement. And it was duly notarized in one of the Bombay papers. That is where my source is. They said this is a stamp paper coalition as far as, you know, Bhivanti in Nizampur is concerned. So, here again you find as a result of this electoral geography, you find a different kind of a party uh, scape here. All right. This is another important manifestation. Now, your constitution provides for these two articles, the district planning committee and later on the metropolitan planning committee. This is one of the few instances where the constitution went to the trouble of laying down some terms of reference of what they should do, that in a district, Matters of common interest between the panchayats and municipalities, physical and natural resources, integrated development of infrastructure, environment, etc., etc. Now, having said that, what is really happening is that we have not really followed the same organizational arrangement in some states as in Maharashtra, whether you call him the guardian minister or the minister in charge of the district. He is the person in charge of the district planning committee. And though the composition is supposed to be from the elected members. This particular article, I must confess, I had more than the necessary share of drafting this. And I am afraid, at the end of trying out what the scene looks like. I have now come to the conclusion that this is a pretty bad mistake on my part. The reason being <clears throat> that the Metropolitan Planning Committee, as you can see, Hyderabad, Chennai, Bangalore, in the case of only Kolkata and Mumbai, this Metropolitan Planning Committee has been constituted. Mumbai, I stand to be corrected because I was told only today that the Mumbai Committee has had more than one meeting and there seems to be some slight interest. <coughs> In the case of Kolkata, again, it's a very limited kind of a <coughs> interaction. <coughs> the reason for this is the very elaborate structure that has been prescribed in this article. There is a double dose of election here. If you have 60 members, two-thirds should be elected from among the elected members and 20 could be nominated and this is what has happened in Kolkata, this is what has been proposed for Bangalore and this is what, you know, is in existence in Maharashtra. The point is, <clears throat> Again, the terms of reference are all right, but if <clears throat> we go back and raise this question, what is different about this MPC, which was not thought about in Maharashtra as early as 1966? The Maharashtra Town and Country Planning Act was a far-reaching act. It had several useful provisions in that, and it also introduced for the first time the concept of a region. And it is in pursuance of that that the MMRDA itself <clears throat> got its act in 1974 and was set up in 1975. <clears throat> but what has happened is that like development authorities in other parts of India, these development authorities get stuck in projects, which is quite understandable because if 
BKC did not happen, MMRDA would not have so much money. And if MMRDA did not have so much money, people would not even bother to attend its meetings. <laughs> but then, you know, there is also another angle to this. This kind of money, if it is available with a state authority, with a parastatal authority, that is quite a temptation for the state government itself. Then why not reach out? It's happened in the case of the Hyderabad Metropolitan Development Authority. So the Hyderabad Metropolitan Development Authority was told at one point of time that you'll go and build this huge peripheral road, the new peripheral road which costs an enormous amount of money. And the purpose appears to be that is it possible for us to sort of try and bring this particular land space into the sphere of real estate development. MMRDA as a result is broke. It lost its office to the US consulate. Had a very nice office in one part of Hyderabad. Now the fellows are broke, they have no money and they have no office. In the case of the Kolkata Metropolitan Development Authority, they did manage to raise some money here and there uh, from Salt Lake. <clears throat> and also, you know, the Chennai and uh, uh, <clears throat> the Development Authority. The state government more or less said, you please divert your money to that and to this. And when I raised this question, the answer I got from the state government was something that would have made Lord Curzon very proud. The response was, the state is a sovereign. The municipality is a creature. The development authority is a creature. It is a sovereign's privilege to allocate and to reallocate money from one creature to another creature. All right. I'm mentioning this not just in a casual way. It, it, it creates a very important design principle. If you feel generating money is what is important, and if you say monetizing urban land is one important way of raising that money, we must understand that we are not the only clever people in the city. A lot of other clever people. And those clever people are constantly eyeing the money that you have already got and see whether it can be applied for some other purpose. So once again you come back to this question, what do you do with this development authorities? And what are the various ways by which they can get into regional level governance issues, regional level planning issues, rather than being sucked into some very specific projects. So there is this problem between macro and micro. The business development plan which was uh, put out by the MMRDA a few years ago, which was drafted by Lee and Associates, uh, they have listed these inhibiting factors in MMRDA fulfilling its regional mandate. And these are the inhibiting factors. And uh, <clears throat> So the state government has not fully recognized the need for alternate resource generation. This is one other, okay? The focus on its role of implementing and coordinating agency with external funded projects. Now these inhibiting factors are not exclusive to MMRDA. They are there with regard to other authorities also. Even the Delhi Development Authority, at some point of time, when Delhi Development Authority got into real estate business, they became land developers, they became plotters. And there is a problem about plotters becoming planners. <laughs> it's not easy. So, we had this Kasturi Rangan committee. Kasturi Rangan is a very, very distinguished uh, the space scientist, as you know. He and Samuel Paul and some of us got together and we labored and we suggested that for Bangalore, you know, whether it is possible to have a different kind of an organizational arrangement for the region and whether some of the other bodies, you know, could deal with some of the implementation functions. A bill was drafted about three years ago. 
every time that bill is about to come into the assembly, something happens to the assembly or something happens to the chief minister. And so my friend said, we have to subject this wretched plan to an astrological analysis. <laughs> so, you know, we are having problem, you know. The bill is a good bill, but uh, it's just not going anywhere near the assembly for some reason or another. So, in essence, what is it that we are facing? Whether you are talking about the municipalities or the metropolitan areas, you have a structural and administrative deficit. During some conversation here, uh, people were asking, what about this famous 73rd and the 74th Amendment? I now feel that this is really a supply side response. And there are very important deficits. And one of the important deficits is the structural and administrative deficit, the pervasive state control. A commissioner appointed by the state government, the commissioner of Mumbai is an exalted person. And that office has been held by highly distinguished people. But the fact remains that he is an appointee of the Maharashtra government. He is not an appointee of the Bombay Municipal Corporation. And the same thing is true of many other cities. And then you also have, therefore essentially, it is the nexus, you know, with the state and not the city. And most mayors, unfortunately, and this is something which many of our foreign friends from UK and US are just not able to understand, that we have this peculiar creation called a ceremonial mayor. The mayor of Bangalore is a one-year wonder. The mayor of Delhi is a one-year wonder. The Maharashtra people, when they embraced this mayor and council system hastily and abandoned it even more hastily, they said, you know, the Calcutta fellows are constitutional fellows and therefore they given five years. Karnataka fellows have given one year, we are clever, let's do it two and a half years. <laughs> so there you have a two and a half year term. And it is very interesting, even when the mayor in council innovation, incidentally when Calcutta introduced the mayor in council, it was before the constitutional amendment. They did not require the constitutional amendment. But they did that. Whereas in the case of Mumbai, when during Manohar Joshi's term, when this MIC model was adopted, there was a peculiar provision which said that the commissioner will submit a confidential report to the state government on the performance of the mayor in council. That was part of that particular amendment act. Fortunately, it was given up. And we are not talking about Curzon here. We are talking about 1996 or whichever is the year when Manohar Joshi ji was there. So, so I think, you know, this particular issue, we have not been able to make up our mind. We want to have a mayor, but it's all right, we have your black coat, have your, you know, gold chain, whatever carrot it is. But, you know, don't ask for executive powers. But in smaller municipalities in Maharashtra, they do have executive powers. The mayor of Sholapur may have more real powers than the mayor of Mumbai. Why? The fear of the big city. The fear of the big city mayor as a political counterweight. The story is best said through the Stalin episode. M.K. Stalin of Tamil Nadu. In 1996, after the uh, Constitutional Amendment, a Comprehensive Local Bodies Act was drafted by Tamil Nadu through a select committee comprising both DMK and ADMK. And that 1996 Act provided for directly elected mayors for Chennai, Coimbatore, Trichy, Madurai and so on. Mr. Stalin successfully fought that election and became the directly elected mayor of Chennai for two terms. 
then KDMK came in. And Jayalalitha felt that a directly elected mayor for the city of Chennai is a potential problem. And therefore, you know, we should cut him down to size. And so she delivered a hammer blow. What was the hammer blow? She said, you can't be both mayor and member of the Legislative Assembly. Fair enough. But she said, retrospectively, you can't be high court. Said, no, no, no. Don't do it retrospective. Do it prospective. And then what she did was, she said this 1996 Comprehensive Local Bodies Act is a pain. Let me revive the 1919-1919 Chennai Corporation Act, under which a mayor is entitled to only one year term. So the 1996 Comprehensive Act was suspended. The 1919 Act was revived. Stalin was thrown out. Fortunes changed. DMK came to power. Stalin became local government minister. One would have thought, since the poor man had that harrowing experience, he would do something about it. Then let sleeping dogs lie. I am local government minister. And therefore, he did not do anything at all, even as local government minister. Fortunes change again. ADMK back in power. Four months ago, again the act was revived. Again direct election of mayors. Again directly elected mayor of Chennai came into position about three months ago. So, between direct and indirect election, between five years and two and a half years and one year, once again the principle of the state as a sovereign comes in. And I cannot help but remind you that this is a part of India's political history. When we got independence in 1947, the first city that was superseded in independent India was Calcutta. Calcutta which was in the vanguard of the national struggle for independence. So if you study the Calcutta administration report, that's beautiful. I mean, after all, you know, we Bengalis, even if we can't do anything else, we write beautiful prose. <laughs> and so we said, at the end of this independence, blood flowed in the streets, there was slaughter, and then Mahatma Gandhi came and brought that miraculous alchemy and brother embraced brother, and everything became love and affection. And then it says in small print, during the year under review, this corporation was also set aside. <laughs> and then this particular phenomenon of setting aside elected corporations by the state government has continued in this country. Even the 1988, uh, the 1888 Act with regard to Mumbai, that was one of the few acts in India and thanks to Feroz Shah Mehta, it did not contain a provision for supersession at all. But that was also amended. And for a brief period, this city corporation was also superseded, though it was a, for a very short time. By and large, the Indian political approach has been, when we are MLAs, when we are MPs, when we are ministers, who can be more representative than others? Why should we have other representatives? And so local government has remained a lesser government. And whatever, you know, maybe the other views about this. <clears throat> so you have this political deficit. And this political deficit is also sanctified by this fantastic pork barrel scheme. The members of parliament, local area development. So every MP, every MLA, every councillor. So essentially, obtaining public exchequer funds for private political gain. After a nine-year battle in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court about a year ago gave this decision that the separation of powers between the elected and the executive wings is not so very strict 
in our constitution and therefore they certified this MPLAD scheme. <clears throat> and so as a result what has happened is that there is hardly anything which can be called a local agenda and therefore <clears throat> the state political agenda subsumes the local agenda. The results of local body elections are only a copy of the state elections. And so in West Bengal, when Mamata Banerjee rode the wave to winning the municipal elections, her agenda had nothing to do with the cities. It was to capture the writer's building, which she eventually did. So here again, there is a very important social and political issue here. Can there be a local agenda? If there is a local agenda, who will participate in that? So you have a participation deficit. Yes, these formal <coughs> bodies do exist under the constitution, but <coughs> there is a certain amount of tension between the elected representatives and the non-government bodies who are not elected. So you have a participation deficit. And this is reflected by the voter turnout. Until about 1972, the urban water turnout was higher in the country. But since 1972, the urban water turnout has been less. So as a result of that, you will find, it's only in a few odd examples that you find a little better turnout, such as in Rajasthan in the most recent elections. So the question is that, as I said, on the one hand, you have your cities and your mega cities as a demographic, economic, spatial and political reality. On the other hand, you have an electoral geography which is not making much of a distinction between what is local and what is not local. And then you have some supply side responses and therefore the overall situation is that is the constitutional approach, the appropriate approach. And more importantly, during the past 15 years, we have all witnessed that though we are a constitution with strong unitary features, we have become a federal arrangement as a matter of political reality. But should federalism stop at the state level? And if you take a situation like Mumbai, before you think of becoming Shanghai second, should we not make a serious attempt of the Mumbai region becoming Mumbai first? And there has to be a distinction between the macro and the micro. There are umpteen things which are required to be done at the micro level, at the city level, at the municipal level. But there are also very many important things which are to be done at the regional level. And like everywhere else, we can lay the contours of a battle. It is that much easier for us to promulgate victory rather than join the battle. And that, unfortunately, is a strong temptation. And in my humble view, the reason why I am spending all this time and talking to us is, I believe we are capable of some thinking towards the future. And we need not be so sterile in our approach as to say there is a union, there is a state, and there is a municipality and there is a hierarchical arrangement. We need to think out of the box. Other metropolitan cities, other globalizing cities in the world do have those kinds of approaches. And my plea is, perhaps we are not applying our mind as much as we should. Thank you.